black like me. Black, 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 black like me. You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G, a podcast that invites you to experience the world through the perspective of one black man, one conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Hello, I'm Dr. Alex G, and I am your proud podcast host of Black Like Me. I'd like to welcome you to season six And this is my mic check. The theme of season six is embracing black joy. To some of your ears, that might sound strange, but it's a concept of black joy that resonates deeply within the heart of black people. And I'm looking forward to the discussions that we're going to have this year around this topic. You know, from the early days of slavery, Um, the whole idea of the fraternization of the slaves meeting together, laughing together, speaking in their native languages was a no, no. And so when, when the slaves would get together and do this, it would make the white slave owners nervous. What are they doing? Are they planning a mutiny? (laughs) Why? Who would, who would want to leave the beautiful bliss of Southern slavery in the United States of America because in their eyes our joy should have centered around them and our work and so they needed to know that we were joyful or happy in their presence while we worked so that perhaps they could sleep at night and so that's why when you look at some of the Americana figures some of those that my sister collects the bibs and the salt shakers and the cookie containers that showed black people smiling, even though their children were being sold, they were being made it and bred with neighbors and sometimes friends in order to create more livestock for the slave owners. Do me a jig smile. Why Sadie? Why aren't you happy? Why aren't you singing Sadie? Because they needed to believe that Sadie was happy serving them because they believe that it was God's purpose for them to be served. And if it was Sadie's purpose to serve, they wanted Sadie to be as happy in it as they were. But when Sadie and others were not around them and they still heard laughter and joking and singing and could tell that there was dancing, they got nervous. And in many ways, those types of gatherings and those kinds of singing songs and even prayer meetings were outlawed. Because it was thought if these people start singing and praying together, they might think that they're as good as us. Joy is often defined as great pleasure or happiness. But in a theological sense, joy has been separated from a feeling or an emotion. So it's not really about a state of happiness, but rather a state of bliss or knowing that you're going to be all right. That joy was the resultant state of understanding that Everything that I have been through is going to prepare me for everything that I'm heading towards. And the fact that I know that this, whatever this is, is not greater than me, gave us joy. The joy is not a feeling or an emotion. It's a knowing. It's a sense. It's like when you finish working out, you have an ex- you have an ex- a, a real um you know, difficult workout and that's that sense or that, 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 that feeling of bliss or euphoria when you're finished is not just because huh, I'm done because you know, you have to come back the next day, but it's the sense that all that I've been through, all the sweating and the gritting and the being spotted and counting will result in broader muscles or smaller waists or stronger legs or better times or better games or better athletic performances equating the heart with the futuristic good gives you a sense of bliss or euphoria in the moment which is more than just joy because you're still hurting and you're aching but the sense that you're going to be all right and you will somehow and your body will somehow use this pain 
for your betterment gives you a sense of joy. So black joy emanated in the midst of slavery and children being sold and spouses being sold and and killed or raped. This joy exploded. Um, Historically, joy grew out of a sense of perseverance that I don't believe that he brought me this far to leave me in an old spiritual sense that when I look at what I've been through or who I have been in the past, my current situation does not change that. And I have a joy, a sense of purpose, a sense of calm, sense of direction, because what is happening to me and around me does not dictate the strength within me. This, this, this is black joy. A hundred years ago, um, as um, my relatives, black folks started uh, moving north, it's called in our history, the Great Migration. Millions of black folks came north. It was, oh, what, 70 years after the Civil War. And then we had Jim Crow and we had all kinds of setbacks and separate but equal and the rise of the KKK who did not exist during slavery. The KKK is a product that was developed after slavery to keep us in our place because now we could buy and sell and compete. And so life was always crazy, but there were some protections when we were property because we were other people's property. And so white people who didn't love us loved their having property. So they weren't going to let people rob their property, rape their property, take advantage of their property. And so when we were no longer property, we were competition and we did not have the protection of government on a local county, state or federal level. So black folks said, I'm out of here and moved to the north thinking that it was going to be somewhat better. But when the black folks came to the north, we brought with us, we we brought our entire selves. And so we brought with us to the north, our music, our culture, our style of worship. Um, We created movies and told stories and, and found out that we were great literary artists because we were great storytellers and great writers, even though we had come out of an era or eras where it was illegal for us to read or write. Yet we came into the North as great novelists. Where did we learn music? Who taught us to read music? Who taught us literature? And we found that with this, within this Northern migration, we found our own voices and we found our own stories. And we also found that some of these expressions were new and unique within the United States. For example, much of the classical music, the Baroque music, that Americans enjoyed was really stolen or taken or borrowed or plagiarized, whatever you want to call it from Europe. Cause the early settlers, although they wanted to be free of Europe still were somehow infatuated with Europe. And so, but our jazz, our gospel, our blues, they became some of America's first original musical art forms. America had not created its own sound. It did not have a soundtrack other than what it replayed, what it sampled from Europe. But black gospel music rooted in the in the in the um, cotton patches and and in the slave homes and the shotgun homes and out in the fields and the bush harbors where people went to steal away to Jesus to pray at night the mixture of pain and the mixture of sorrow and the mixture of fatigue mixed with a glimpse of joy. Oh my God, joy created a sound of call and respond and rifting that influenced jazz and blues and bluegrass and country Western and rock and roll and soul and hip hop. And that grew out of an expression of black joy that was grounded in black hope that this too will pass. We're stronger than this. We're smarter than them. 
we will outlast that and we will get our lives back. These joyful expressions that were birthed out of pain and suffering and denial of humanity and citizenship became this great expression that was loved by Europe. These black novelists and, and dancers and actors were loved overseas because they'd never seen anything like this. And black people knew how to act like they had been there before. We had mainly been to Europe the same way we'd come to the United States and the Caribbean and Brazil in chains. But we showed up in double breasted suits, wool worsted double breasted suits and leather shoes and silver and gold and glittering and 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 and, and, and just and just slaying. And we found spaces outside of the Americas that celebrated our voices, helped to proliferate our voices, paid us for those voices. Great, great, great joy. Meanwhile, back in the United States, in this separate but equal society, black folks still exuded joy in our cuisine and our clothes and our art and our faith and our industriousness. We call it our swag. No matter where we were, no matter where we were, we brought ourselves. And that shine, that sheen, that swag is called black joy. You can have nothing in your pocket, but they're pressed. My white friends would always tease, like, man, why do you have creases in your jeans? Jeans aren't supposed to have creases. But black folks grew up in spaces where you might have only had one pair or two pair to get you through the whole year. So you washed them every night and you pressed them and you had a crease and it might be poor people's clothes, but it's poor people's clothes with a crease and you wore it with pride. And so even though that there was nothing, sometimes nothing or many times nothing in our pockets, Oh man, there was stuff in our heart and songs and dreams and hope that stayed buoyant because of joy. And people didn't understand it. Slave owners tried to beat it out of folks. Like, what makes you so happy? Do you think you're better than me? Do you think you're smarter than me? What's that smirk on your face, boy? But this buoyant sense of joy got the world's attention. And it seems like the more we joyed, the more they feared. What the hell could they be so happy about? And what are they plotting? What are they, what are they doing? We move into the 50s and the 60s and we have this wonderful Black is Beautiful movement. Uh, so I remember hearing James Brown sing, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. It's on the swings, on the seesaws. We didn't call them teeter-totters. On the seesaws, jumping rope. I'm black and I'm proud. I, I was born on the west side of Chicago and that's where I lived until I was about six years old. But it was nothing. It was nothing. And we didn't even understand blackness. And I don't even know if we fully understood proud. But we understood that hook. And we understood that it was for us. And to us. And so we sang it and we sang it and we sang it and we harmonized it and we hooked it say it loud I'm black and I'm proud but that black joy permeated our music and it came into our hi-fi stereos in our front rooms as we call them in our black community the living room or the family room we call them the front rooms as we listened because music was either baroque or was classical or it had no words or it had four stanzas and it had words like thee and thou and thus and it sang to a deserving Jesus to a deserving God but to have music that spoke to us not not just about us but to us telling us to be black and proud it was our mantra it was our duty hell it was our obligation we have been blessed with blackness and we must honor it with pride. This whole thing of black being beautiful was powerful and uplifting and appropriate. And so things, you know, when I moved to Wisconsin, things kind of went to a screeching halt because it was an all white reality. But I digress. But in this movement, 
of, of, of black is beautiful and say it loud, you're black and you're proud. I think it made people even more nervous. It was an affront somehow to the white establishment. How dare you be black and proud? We, haven't we told you that black is dirty? Haven't we told you that black is nasty? Haven't we told you that black is wrong? Haven't we told you that God doesn't like black? Haven't we told you to stay in your place? And now we're singing it? With our mini skirts and our Vaseline legs and our bell bottom pants and our patent leather shoes and our our perfect um 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 perfectly shaped afros we danced we funky chickened and we pigeoned and we penguined and we monkeyed and we want to seat to our own mantra that we're black and we're proud and we're beautiful now they already knew that but they didn't know that we knew that they knew and perhaps they thought we had forgotten but James Brown and others reminded us we knew we had it going on whips and chains and second citizen lines and separate drinking fountains and toilet seats didn't convince us that we were ugly it reinforced that we were beautiful and society was threatened by us but our strong black proud or black pride was an affront to the white establishment not white people culturally because there's no such thing as white people. It's a social construct. White people are a mixture of folks who are British and French and German and Norwegian. And you know what I'm saying? But it was an affront to the white social and economic establishment. That we were building our own empires, our own cities, our own Tulsa's, our own Harlem's, our own venues, our own plays. We were creating our own industry. Now, keep in mind, we had no industry in slavery. And with sharecropping, we really had no industry in the South. But in the North, we began to create industry through culture, through culture. And that threatened the hell out of the white establishment. So we had something eventually that was called integration. I know this makes my white listeners nervous and white people nervous when they hear a black man bash integration. Well, don't you like being able to live any place you want to or go any place you can? First of all, you make the assumption that I can live any place I want to and that I can go any place I want to and that I can do anything that I want to go back and listen to season two. But what we called integration really wasn't why. Because when black kids went to white schools, black teachers did not go to white schools. Our black black math teacher didn't teach math in white schools. Our black biology teachers didn't te teach biology in white schools. So 30,000 black teachers were unemployed, lost their jobs, strong middle class folks who took their teacher salary to send their kids to historically black colleges and to go to black theaters and to buy clothes from black stores and to buy cars from black dealerships and to buy black literature from black bookstores and to support black churches. But that money was gone because black kids were integrated. Doesn't integration mean a blending? This was nothing more than a social raping of black intelligentsia and the displacement of black intelligentsia our teachers and it just put a blade in the heart of black economy and our black souls and black people being so happy that we can go now to white ballparks although we had a section or we sat in the bleachers or we're still called names or ridiculed we started taking our money to the white malls, to the white ballparks, to the white stores, to the white theaters, to the white car dealerships, because we could do white and we can buy white and we can be with white. And our black industry, our black brilliance languished. We lost our sense of culture. 
We sacrificed it the way the Irish did and the Germans and other Euro-American folks who for the ability to be white negated what it meant to be Irish. So you ask the average white person my age about their ethnic background and they'll name it. I'm quarter Scott, quarter British, but ask them about the traditions, the cultures. What a part, what a, what about um, your culture, your food, your traditions, your celebrations exudes um, your Scottish background, your, your, your Norwegian background. Most folks won't really know because somebody sold the knowledge of that and the importance of that to be white in America, which really meant not black, not Indian, not Mexican, not foreign. I want to be on the side with access. So season six is about the incredible resurgence of unapologetic joy around being unapologetically black. So wearing hair long again, and not just afros, but twists and dreads. I mean, when we watch television, we watch football players, we're shocked when they don't have braids or twists or locks. See basketball players with four and five inch hair and these huge French braids or twists and the clothing and the sound and the stance that we take, the challenge that we take. It's this resurgence of being unapologetically black. So in this season, I'm gonna to talk to people who are philosophers, who are artists, who are entrepreneurial, who are wives and daughters, who are, who are writers, and who are entrepreneurs who are exploring what it means to be black unapologetically, to embrace black joy, this sense of buoyancy by no longer denying who we are and denying what has made us who we are. So what does that look like now? And what does it feel like? And how do blacks respond to this other blacks? And how do whites and non-blacks respond to this? What will be the benefit of this resurgence of unapologetic blackness? And what's the cost? Regardless, black folks and blackness are trending. I want to be your guide on this journey in understanding what it means to embrace blackness. Black folks, I hope that you learn to celebrate it more. And there's no one way of celebrating blackness because we all know there is no such thing of a monolithic blackness. There's no black monolith. We get to be tennis players and downhill skiers and scuba divers too. We can be flexible because we are flexible and adaptive people and for non-black people, I want you to understand when black folks want black space, what does it mean? And I don't need your approval for this. I just want you to understand it because many times when you have a chance to be philanthropic with your time or your resources and there's an effort that's pro-black and supporting black and you might be tempted to say like many good intention people have said to me, but isn't that reverse discrimination, Alex? Don't we all just want to be together? Shouldn't we just be American and not black American? We have been trying to co-sign with this country for 400 years. We've been trying to be a part of it. We are trying to be sons and daughters of a nation we help birth. And it hasn't really gone well for us. But what about Oprah? I know about Oprah. But what about Michael? I know about Michael Jordan. What about President Obama? I know. But do you also understand that all the pushback, much of the pushback we're experiencing politically is because this nation had the audacity to hire a black man to lead its nation? Do you understand everything right down to even the assault on the Capitol on January 6th? is pushed back from having had the audacity to have a black man in the White House, someone like Tiger Woods at the Masters. When we show up, we show out and show that 400 years of atrocities 
have not gutted us fully. And black joy is priming that pump. Black joy is remembering the songs and the stories and the styles and the swagger and the people who lived, then they bled and that they died. Not so that I could be whitewashed, but so that I could be black unapologetically and American rightfully because we wore uniforms and we took up arms and we jumped out of airplanes and we sailed on naval ships and we fought in infantries. But being American is not enough to make us not be black. We must be black and American. We must be black and American. Because don't forget, <laughs> we were black before we were American. Don't try to make us choose. We do in the world and have done a world of favor by being both. We have made this country rich and we have blown the world's mind with our cuisine and our culture and our food and our sound and our swag. My joy is having a black voice. My joy is having supporters who get behind my black voice. My joy is being able to say whatever the hell I need and want and feel led to say for the proliferation of black thought and black liberty and black intellect and black enterprise and yes black joy for the sake this time around for real integration that will make society better my blackness does not live in a bubble I brood in my black joy that I may blacken my world and bring a little joy and strength and wisdom and wit and common sense and faith and leadership. Say this thing loud. I am black and so proud and I too embrace my black joy. And I don't care who likes it who doesn't <laughs> this season is going to rock thank you for being a part of black like me hold on to your seats this is going to be a good season black like me black 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 like thank you so much for joining us in season six of black like me with dr alex g now I've got some special shout outs to the many talented members of our ever growing production team. Eli Steenlich, who produces the show and handles all of our social media. Don Thornton, my podcast manager, who keeps things running smoothly and arranges all of my interviews. Jeremy Holiday, who edits the podcast. Corey Saffold, who created this year's theme music and Marcus Fleming on the vocals. And of course, Jakeisha Hunt, who is responsible for our fabulous new podcast merch. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. You can find out more about Dr. Alex G's amazing work at alexg.com. Black Like Me is sponsored by the generosity of the Human Family Unity Foundation. Black like me.